human rights violation cases or reports have been seen so far, and what are your interventions in this this year? So our report is yet to be completed. And therefore we hope that by January, our report should be ready. So what we also do is that we want to have synergy. National Human Rights Commission also document human rights violations in the country. So we, that's one authentic document that we could rely on and then add it to our report. So essentially, to I respond to your question, I might not be able to give you a number at this moment because the report is yet to be finalized. But I can assure you that once it is ready, we'll share it with you. Thank you. Have you intervened in any of the cases? Oh yes, people, people come here, people call about human rights abuses. Um, in, in many cases, we have so many cases that we, we receive. Our, our, our role is not to um, uh, adjudicate, uh, but essentially we also serve as an intermediary between the citizens and the National Human Rights Commission and also documents uh, right abuses. And because we have a model called Badimbu, so Badimbung is a local palapa. It's a traditional mechanism that we institute as an organization to address human rights violations and abuses at the community level. So uh, I remember just last week we received a complaint about somebody that has to do with marriage, actually. So um, somebody has been in marriage for about 10 years, and, and, and she complained. She came here, she complained. I'm not going to uh, disclose the identity for privacy reasons. And, 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 and she complained that the husband is not, is not a man, you know, in court. So um, I want our organization to intervene. Uh, she feel like her, her right to enjoy her, her marriage is being inflicted upon by her parents. And what we did was, because the Badimbu is elders in our communities who enforce some of those things, resolve those things, we, we, we hand over the matter to them. And I'm pleased that the matter has been resolved. So, so this is our little contribution to making a Gambia uh, a big one of hope when it comes to human rights for all. Thank you. Yes. Yes. yes good morning. Uh, my name is Ndaisi Sen, working yes. for Lela Media. Yes. And during your statement, you did mention about um, citizens' lack of awareness to their own rights. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to know at your level as an organization, what have you done so far with regards to civic education to make sure that these rights are aware in case whenever they are violated, they were able to know what to do. And the second question is, uh, with regards to the gender-based violence, mm -hmm. um, we all know this is something that has been happening in our society. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, when it happens, all what we tend to do is muslaha and then disposing at the family level, mm -hmm. and thus making victims reluctant to speak to the public. Mm -hmm. So what can this organization do to make sure that the culture of silence is, I mean, break down? Well, thank you very much. Those are very important questions. First and foremost, as a human rights organization, our primary focus is to educate people about their rights. In fact, human rights education is key in whatever we do. And in 2017, we piloted the establishment of human rights education clubs in schools across the Gambia. With the support of the US Embassy, we piloted this in 12 schools. And this year, we launched a 48th school meaning we have our clubs established in 48 high schools across the country. And we are working with community-based organizations as well. And we provide thousands of copies of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights through the Youth for Human Rights International. And through these clubs, we've reached out to thousands of young people and community leaders, women, across the country, educating them about their rights. And I'm happy that a good number of our beneficiaries now are aware of their fundamental human rights and will continue to do that because that's the only way forward. We believe that with the human rights education clubs in schools, there is going to be sustainability because we cannot be everywhere. But the teacher coordinators, <coughs> excuse me, the teacher coordinators we have in the schools and the club members will continue to learn more about their rights and then also educate others about their rights. So definitely we are doing great uh, in that area. A lot of schools have been covered. In fact, our human rights education program covered almost all regions of the Gambia except North Bank region. And the reason be is because of resource constraint. So all the regions of the Gambia, from Banjul to Basi, our human rights education program covered all these regions except North Bank region. And the reason is that because of resource constraint. And we are hoping that by next year, we'll explore opportunities. We are talking to authorities in that region and youth leaders to see how best we can also 
uh, cover the entire country by covering that region. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Gender-based violence is a serious problem. It's about the attitudes of the people, the Muslim has syndrome. We just saw one recently, a stepfather, if you follow what's on Gambia, was accused of impregnating. Can you imagine? Your own daughter. But we've seen in this country, people, kids were raped even at the age of nine years old. We had incidents, incidents of all these things. But the problem here is that if you want to report, you know what happened, the community members, the family members will say, you know what, I'm in Jalala. It doesn't worth it. If you do that, you're going to bring shame to the family. And now, it's not only human rights organizations like ours, but the media could play a role in this. Because, <coughs> excuse me, if your media house reported an incident, and it, it goes viral, then it's going to be difficult even for the police to bury that case, to hide it under the table. So we have to speak up, encourage more people to speak up, and then start also prosecuting people. Because if we don't prosecute people, others will continue to do it. And our kids will continue to suffer. And our women will continue to suffer. Our girls will continue to suffer in silence. So we must continue to report these cases. But also, our law enforcement authorities must prosecute. Must prosecute the violators. Because that's the only way forward. So at our level, we'll continue to engage communities to speak up. Because that's the only way out. Because if you don't speak up, you, you can't hear, you can't know about these issues. They happen. Last time I was following what on Gambia, somebody said, you know, you reported this, but this is happening. It has been happening in our communities. And I agree, it has been happening. But Muslaha, they will say, you bring shame to the family. Don't talk about it. So all of us should speak as ambassadors, speaking against all these social biases in our community. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, sorry. I want to speak in Wolof because. I'm not sure if it's against the law. So they the Thank you very much. I don't know, Haruna, if you if will be able to be of help. My wall off is very bad. No one wants to hear my wall off here. Uh, so yes, we follow that case. Um, so essentially, the police, I don't know how far have they gone with the case, but I, I'm sure you know they cannot just deport somebody just because you are alleged of committing a crime. The due process must be followed. Otherwise, people like me will start talking that Gambia is, is, is just deporting people without the due process. So irrespective of their nationalities, whether they are Gambian, they are Nigerian, so, you know, anyone can be a criminal. We have Gambians who are criminals, I'm sorry, but we have Gambian criminals in America, yeah. Gambian criminals in Asia, in Europe and all over the world. So the due process has to be followed. Probably that is a strategy by the police to calm down the tension, to ensure that they, they leave that place and then move to a different location while their cases proceed in court. So essentially, and also they, are also they have rights to bail as well. So I believe, that the reason why they are asked to go to that place and leave this other place is to ensure that there is peace and tranquility at this particular location. And then just allow the due process of the law to take its course. But I can assure you there is a lot of interest in the case, and I'm sure the police will definitely pursue this case. Yes, as expected of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jawahar. You're welcome. I'm just going to press. The friend in this country. Yes. Uh, my question goes will go to about this uh, title of bill at the parliament. Mm -hmm. When you know the table it was in the parliament. Mm -hmm. But as the organization of human rights organization, mm -hmm. what effort are you making to invade the committee of human rights in the parliament so that this bill can come into the force? Thank you very much. We are rolling out for your information series of activities under our post TRRC engagement. 
next year, starting next month. And part of those engagements is to engage the Human Rights Committee of the National Assembly, not only on the torture bill, but all other issues that people feel like National Assembly should do and they are not doing as far as protecting their rights are concerned. So be rest assured, the engagements will start as of next month under our post-TRC -TR engagement activities. Through the National Assembly, we're going to work with the Select Committee on Human Rights to ensure that the bill you know, is passed into law and also to ensure that whatever the National Assembly should do, because I believe the National Assembly, they have a big mandate to do, big responsibility to do. So many human rights violations are taking place and sometimes you feel like if we don't have a National Assembly in this country, our members definitely need to speed up. So, so to answer your question in short, we'll definitely engage them starting next month under our post-TRC engagement activities. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Yes. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my concern is, uh, Bekanyan has been working with you very hard in the rural Gambia. Yes. You know, uh, particularly in the and in Sierra. Yes. Area. Yes. So I want to know what are some of the challenges because it's a rural community for people to come out and express various forms of human rights violations mm -hmm. made upon them. It's always a problem. How do you? You know, work with them to ensure that you extract the the information and compile their cases. I want you to elaborate on that, please. Well, thank you very much, Kebans. That's a very important question. So I believe it's about organizational credibility. If community members feel like this is a credible organization, this is an organization that we can rely on, and this is an organization that empower us to speak up and they will always stood by us, no matter what, they will talk to you. So even last week, I received a very sensitive complaint that you, you haven't seen in any media house so far. Uh, and we're trying to work with the communities as to how. <laughs> no, uh, that is the one reason why the communities trust us. That is one reason why the communities trust us. So we empower them with knowledge. We help them to know their fundamental rights and how they can claim those rights. So essentially, uh, rural communities, you know, we also, as a, a grassroots organization, we are more focused, like you said. Uh, of course, we have national events that, we are take, that are taking place in Banjul, but as a grassroots organization, what we do is that we are very much aware of the social cultural context of the communities. We have diverse communities. What may not be a crime in Nyani, may be a crime in Uli. What may not be a crime in, in Combo may be a crime somewhere in Kiang. So we are very much aware of the context of the communities. And because we are sensitive to their needs and their cultural beliefs, we know how to navigate to ensure that we educate them and work closely with them side by side to ensure their rights are protected, but also help them in fulfillment of some of those rights. And that is why we have a unit that is responsible for community development, implementing small community development initiatives at the community level. But essentially, our secret is, let me tell you, is using the human rights-based approach to development. That when government provides you with clean drinking water, it's not a charity. It's not a charity that government is giving you. If government provides you with a health center, it's not a donation from the president or the ministers. It is your tax money. And therefore, keep speaking to them. Keep talking to your National Assembly members. Keep making noise to the government to ensure that you have access to all these facilities that you deserve. So communities now realize, ah, on the whole, we were dancing. And say government provided this and that. We are dancing and clapping for them. On the whole, it's our own money that they didn't know before. And now they know that this is their own money and they can claim for it and communities now have more confidence in us and will continue to speak for their rights and when, whereas we are not there, I can assure you that the community members will continue to speak for the protection of their own rights. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.
benen mo o lo tane comprendre len bi ndey jot subvention bu doy pour ñu support matrice yeen ban jéego ngeen wara jël pour government bi ñu make sure ñi nga xam ñu nek ci matrice am nañ drive pour dégg def bu gos ñu bari ñi ngi commencer bayyi arabie school bi gos af amul payment ci sun fi benen bu moy wax ngeen am ngeen yeen club ci ma daal club ci school ndax ci fort ci yi ngi tudé non amna yo xamné ci matrice yi amna yo xamné am ngeen fa club thank you very much this is a very important question for your information access to education is a fundamental human right and that is why we signed mou with the ministry of basic and secondary education for us to be able to penetrate the school system and reach out to schools and our mou with the ministry is due for review and one thing that definitely we need to consider is this issue of madrasas that we are talking about uh, i agree with you that uh, the ministry is supporting some of the madrasas not all and that is a challenge and even yesterday i saw in the news that uh, the high education minister yes. was talking about it university. about the university for arabic students i think this is unfair uh, there should be nothing like uh, segregation or distinction as to what type of education someone want to have in this country and one way to realize that access to education right is accessibility and affordability so if a uh, government is not providing or is not doing enough in that regard government again is found wanting government is found wanting and it is my responsibility that of my organization and yourself as a media professional that we raise the alarm so that the government to our national assembly members should do the needful to ensure that our brothers and sisters going to the madrasa schools also access the quality relevant education that they deserve like anyone else who is going to news what gambia high school university of the gambia or anywhere else i hope that answered your question how about your organization about it it's more like clubs or well, the clubs uh, to be honest our clubs we don't have any chapter in any of the madrasas but interestingly some of our human rights champions that we are champion in human rights education in schools with are madrasa students ironically so hopefully we should encourage them to take us to their schools as well i hope that answers your question and we give chance to somebody who don't ask yes uh, yeah. maybe we may take only three more questions if you don't mind yeah i'd like yeah. to ask uh, especially i'm a student of bagode okay and we are seeing recently some of these schools are forcing students to pay hundreds of dollars mm -hmm. to attend their studies. Mm -hmm. And some students are complaining during weekends, they go for skills, they go for other to other schools. Mm -hmm. And they are forced to pay hundreds of dollars to go and attend these studies. And yes. these teachers sometimes, they don't care whether you attend studies or not. Mm -hmm. But they are care of you paying the money. And if you don't pay, when exam comes, you will not sit for the exam. Mm -hmm. And yesterday also, I saw it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. A teacher is hitting a student. Wow. She's a girl. Wow. A video. Mm -hmm. The teacher is hitting the student so severely, and I don't know what the student do, but I don't think she that is right. You know? Sure. Yeah. So yes, no one has the right to beat anyone. No. It's against fundamental human rights. No one has the right to to, to to anyone. That is wrong. Whatever, we don't even need to ask what the student might have done to the teacher. The action of the teacher is wrong, but that's the bottom line. You cannot take the law into your own hand. Secondly, about the study fees, right? Yeah. That the teachers are asking students to pay. And this, you know that we result to some students dropping out of school because of discrimination and stigma. If they said, if you don't pay, you cannot come for school, for instance, you might end up dropping out of school, right? And to answer your question, it is illegal. It is wrong for any teacher to demand a dime for any study classes. Teachers are doing it, and their justification is that some of the students are weak, they cannot perform well, you know, within the normal contact hours, so you need extra time to help them to do better. But the answer to your question is, it is wrong, it is illegal to take a boot from any parent or student for study classes. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Jamal. Um, today, my dear companions, um, you've talked about uh, right to life uh, in your speech, yes. in one of your paragraphs. Okay. So, but this thing I'm talking about 
-hmm. is concerned in the rural areas. We have been intervening in the rural communities, unlike Mr. Kivase. Yes. And this is something that we have been hearing about and we have been seeing mm -hmm. much more in the upper river region, mm -hmm. particularly in the Sarabule community that is called the caste system, mm -hmm. where you know one group of the, the community will consider themselves as the royals and the other group will consider themselves as the slaves. Mm -hmm. And now we are hearing that the slaves are not entertaining that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is causing too much of conflict between them. Here and there we are hearing them fighting and they are killing each other. That's true. And that killing is result to seizing someone's life anyways. And you people are here and you intervene in the aspect of human rights. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing about that as far as you are concerned? I know one thing about your, your organization that I am even part of, that is the big Bari uh, Mugimisi, mm -hmm. that I know might be having an intervention in Absolutely. this aspect. So Absolutely. What, what are you doing about it? Thank you very much, Mr. Mane. So uh, this issue of uh, slavery, especially among the Sarahule communities in the URR, unfortunately, uh, our organization is fully aware of it. In fact, we had a series of engagements in this office with those they called slaves. Those that they are calling as slaves. We had a series of meetings with them here in this office. And we opened a file for them. And we reported the matter to the National Human Rights Commission as to what we've been doing about it. But essentially, at the level of our organization, I mentioned about the Badimbun Initiative. So what Badimbun does, as far as this thing is concerned, recently, Without even the involvement of the office here, the structures in the community assembled at Diabubu in Sandu, without the coordination of the office, the Badimbu Initiative leaders, they brought together people of different clans from the Sarahule communities at Diabubu to discuss among themselves. I might be seen as, a, as an outsider. I'm not a Sarahule. I can't even speak the language. Maybe somebody may see me as someone who's been paid to fight for a cause. But what you do is that, allow the Sarahules, who you work with, and they know these issues as human rights violations, to go back to their people, engage them, talk to them. And uh, the reports that we receive, the feedbacks we are receiving, is that a good number of uh, people in those communities who attended those sessions are beginning to realize that, in, you know what? We need to uh, reconsider our position because we are all born free and equal as human beings, in dignity for that matter. So yes, slowly but surely. Among the elders, it's sometimes difficult. But the young ones, that, that's why most of our programs, we target the young. As they grow up, you can always have that change of mindset in them. That you know what? You cannot be going with a friend that your father is calling his father our slave. You know, or if, 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 if your friends come to your house, your father or your mother is calling him or her a slave. So as a young person who is going to school and you know about your rights, you, you will definitely join the, 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 the campaign to end the practice. And that is how we are ending it, by engaging our local structures, especially the influential Sarahules in our Badimbu initiative. And we hope they will continue to engage each other because this is very, very wrong. And no one in the 21st century should be, should be, in, I repeat, in this country, be uh, treated as a slave in this 21st century. And government need to definitely do something about it. I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Jami. Yes, we'll take only two questions now. We have another activity at Kutu and another one at the petroleum house. Jundel. Yes. Um, the first question I want to ask is with regards to, you did mention that the continent, and Gambia in particular, is far from reaching the dream land in terms of human rights. Yes. Um, in a scale of 100, how would you read the government of the Gambia, or the Gambia in general, when it comes to human rights? And the second one is the TRRC and the White Paper Report. Do you think, as an organization, the Barrow-led government, will give the much needed justice to these victims of human rights violations. And finally, as an organization um, who has been advocating for human rights uh, in, in this country, what would you be doing differently come 2023? Wow, a lot of interesting questions. And the first one is the difficult question, I have to be honest with you. Um, because it has to do with uh, evaluating our progress, like I said in the statement, significant progress, you know, is taking place. We have for the first time National Human Rights Commission. We've never had that in the Gambia. You know that. Uh, for the first time, we have several human rights organizations in the country. 
you know, to the creation of uh, CSOs that are advancing human rights in the country. These are significant progress. We've seen landmark judgments in our courts. Even the president lost a case. I think you remember that. Who can lose a case against Jami? He never think about that. He, he said he has a, his own hotel. So with all these things, definitely, significant progress have definitely uh, are taking place in our country. We have to definitely recognize that. But you know what? The, the, the human right is not only about, you know, uh, not torturing people. No, it's beyond that. It's beyond that. I said in his statement, a good number of young people and kids are sitting at home, they are not going to school in this country. He mentioned an example of Arabic students. That's a fundamental human right. And one thing about human rights, we people fail to understand, they are interrelated and interdependent. Meaning you cannot say, okay, we are a champion of human rights, no one has been tortured, we are not arresting anyone arbitrarily. But you know that your people are suffering in the communities without access to clean drinking water. Your people are suffering, they don't have access to quality health care. So you can imagine, socioeconomic rights. And governments all over the world will tell you that, you know, these are rights that, you know, you can only realize them if you have the resources. That's, that's unacceptable. So, to come back to your question, my honest opinion, and, and I, I believe this will be the stand of our organization that I speak for, so if it is 100%, uh, uh, you are to judge the Gambia's performance, I can say the Gambia at the moment is at 35% out of 100, as far as human rights promotion, education, protection, and, and everything else that you came about. So that essentially tells you, 35 from 100. Are we close to it? That's the answer. The second question is about what? Yes, the second yeah. question is, under the battle-led administration, yes. do you think that just um, the victims will have that, no, that victims will have the much needed justice under his administration? Yes, I believe. That is, that is, that is, the, that is as of now, the belief of our organization, and we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. We are engaging the victims on a regular basis. We have a database of victims that we are dealing with, most especially the political victims, people who are victimized because of their political affiliation to opposition at the time. So uh, we'll give the government the benefit of the doubt. If I'm to give you the opinion of the victims that we are dealing with, a good number of them told us that they don't believe they will have justice from this government as far as TRS is concerned. But as an organization, we want to give them the, give them the benefit of the doubt. We believe that they will, give, they will deliver justice. But until such a time that we realize they are not doing it, our position will change. But for the victims, if you ask them, that is their position. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Final question. Um, Jawari, thank you very much. Yes, uh, who is that? Oh, um, I just want to emphasize on the okay. issue of commercial drivers in this country. Okay. Because since uh, the Ministry of Transport mm -hmm. uh, gave out the official tariff mm -hmm. in this country, mm -hmm. still now definitely uh, the commercial drivers are, not, are, are, are refusing to abide by those rules. Mm -hmm. They are charging customers whatever they want to sell. Mm -hmm. And still now definitely the, the Ministry is saying that, you see, why can't they use the police to implement that law fully? Mm -hmm. So why is the organization taking in that? Also, we have relevant authorities, like you mentioned, who deals with transportation and all that. That's not our domain. But anywhere we see so citizens suffer, then now there's a potential human rights violation. When citizens suffer, you cannot have, you know that free movement from one place to another is a fundamental human right. You wake up in the morning, you want to come to Bekanya, it's your right to have free movement. And government has to facilitate that. So if there is an infringement on that, and therefore it becomes a human rights issue for us. So the only thing that we would like to say about that is uh, we call on the relevant authorities, that is the ministry responsible for transportation, to ensure that there is a, a level playing field for the drivers and the passengers. So that at the end of the day, there is going to be a win-win situation for both the commuters, uh, the passengers and the drivers. But like I said, that the competent authorities who deal in that area as the spe specialization uh, will be the right authorities to handle this question. But like I said, free movement is a fundamental human right. And if there are uh, structural barriers or <coughs> issues that is undermining that free uh, enjoyment by citizens, right, uh, it becomes a human right issue. And that is why I would like to call on the relevant authorities to definitely uh, speed up the process of ensuring that there is level playing field 
for the drivers and the passengers. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Yeah. So I want to know what your view is. Thank you. So we are an advocacy organization. We advocate and promote and hold the duty bearers accountable. That is our mandate, as far as our human rights function is concerned. We educate people about their rights, and we advocate for the duty bearers to ensure that everyone's right is respected and hold them accountable. You understand? So that's what we do. We are not an organization that takes cases to court. Hopefully in the future, we might decide to do that, but you know how costly that could be. But right now, that is out of our mandate. I hope that answered your question. Yes, yeah, advocacy. Of course, and promote it. You know, you promote by human rights education in schools and communities and hold the duty bearers accountable. And if you follow the media very well, if someone's right is respected, we investigate at our level. And then we'll have a public statement and call on the government to ensure that there's remedy. So that is accountability. Yes, so we hold the duty bearers accountable. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've been reminded that. Yes. Um, from the Malachi to Alu Libya, um, Saint Camions in Yungi Libya, Bepare Yungi Sapa, a lot, Saint Prison, Bepare, I mean, a brilliant dictator, because a young woman interviewed when a Libyan victim of Mantini, Mone Anna, hundreds of Gambian Yamantini, Monalin, Dim Yamantini, Bin Aigo, Yungi Libya, the Gambian, the Saint Prison, Benin Fanek, the Fali. Uh, thank you very much. As, as a human rights organization, in the past we've intervened in human rights abuses of citizens of the Gambia in other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, we also monitor the situation in Libya with keen interest like we are doing in the media. Uh, I think the government of the Gambia need to engage their Libyan counterparts. Because human rights are universal. Meaning, wherever you go, whether you are in Libya, whether you are in Senegal, whether you are in America, wherever you may be, human rights are universal. So we all the Gambian authorities to engage their Libyan counterparts to ensure that the rights of Gambians and all the Africans, because mostly it's the Africans who suffer in their cells, are protected. Because the Libyan authorities must know that they have an obligation. But again, we have to understand that Libya is one country that doesn't have a stable government. <laughs> so you can imagine, a country where there is no stable government, anything could happen. Even though we are not saying that should be a basis for the violation of human rights. They are universal. So the only thing that we're going to say here is that in response to your question, we owe the Gambian authorities through the Minister of Foreign Affairs to engage their Libyan counterparts to ensure that Gambians and wisdom in their gates have their rights respected. You know that even prisoners have rights. So let the Gambian, gov the Gambian government, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, engage their Libyan counterparts to ensure that our, our brothers and sisters in Libya, in their gates, have their rights respected. Who are you? Ben, Ben, Lab interview. Yes, yes. Wow. Wow. The Nadan P. Jelly, the Barret, invite now Gambian Spine. The Barret, she invite woman, Mona Denale Rail, come now. Why not be guys in your good job? Nipuneta, Snake and she does a four hundred dollars in order to put ticket be Manadu. So Barret, the Del, why take again and I see prison be, why come Nepun de la de Loga. Mona Monsipo, who Rajal of Samone. So have you engaged the Gambian authorities on that? No. I think that's what you should do. Yeah. This is government's responsibility. Yeah. There's an allegation against our government. Mm. Use, use your medium to engage our government okay. through the Minister of Foreign Affairs okay. and said I spoke to a Libyan who said A, B and C. What is the position of our government? Because we cannot speak for the government. But we can all the government to do the needful. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, it's been a long marathon uh, press briefing. All my senior colleagues, I said, they've gone to Basti and then they gave me this big lot here. They should have been here helping me respond to your questions, but they've all gone. 
so uh, making it so difficult for me, but I hope we've been able to meet your expectation. At least you'll have one news item from this conversation, if not many. Uh, so you can always reach out to us. Our doors are always open. We are going to be very busy coming here uh, because, like I said, TRRC uh, report implementation and government white paper is very important for this country. It's very important for this country. And, and because of that, we're going to roll out a lot of activities and we look forward to engaging all of you in those activities from here all the way to Pasi. And we're really grateful for your time. Uh, we hope that the relationship between our organization and your, organize, and your media organizations will continue to uh, be further strengthened with your support. But I must make sure and uh, emphasize that human rights is everyone's business. Sometimes somebody told me my, about my mentor, uh, Madi Jobate. He said, Madi, they would call me uh, privately and said, your mentor haven't spoken about this particular human rights violation. I would always tell them that, is Madi being paid to talk about human rights in this country? Everyone can talk about it. Everyone can talk about it. We can all be human rights activists. In your media, recently somebody was awarded by GPU for reporting on human rights issues. And we even share that in our Facebook page. So essentially, you can all advocate for the development of human rights. Essentially, you are all doing it in one way or the other. Because if you advocate for access to clean drinking water, it's a human rights issue. So I, I implore on all of you to keep speaking, keep talking and writing about human rights for the betterment of our country. And once again, thank you very much for coming. You want to say something? Yes, something in addition. Yes. Um, someone asked a question regarding the, the Nigerian being here yes. about the, the, the problem that happened. Yes. You know, the same human rights laws that are designed by the uh, UN, yes. the same laws yes. that yes. define the international laws. Absolutely. So if something happened in the country, Absolutely. Nigeria could have said they want their citizens. Absolutely. But it has to pass through the means of foreign affairs. That's their law they call international law of extradition. Absolutely. So then they extradite their citizen from the Gambia, then due process will follow. Absolutely. But you cannot come to a country because of ignorance of the law, you take it as an advantage. So anything that happened, the, uh, the country has to take their own laws. But a country's order within your country can also ask for the same, the same individual to the law of contradiction, okay. uh, extradition. That's, uh, that's, that's true. On that note, thank you very much for coming. And please, before you go, we have a small token of transport reform. See my colleague, Sana, for that. Let me just sign this statement. If you like, you can use everything in the statement, and even what I said out of the statement. I think that's, I have said more.